Okay, so we just got done with week 17 and the playoffs are, they're basically here. The seeding is almost all sorted out, so let's get right into the recap. Oh, Joe, Joe, please, it's its too much. You, you, you can't keep doing this. I, I'm not even around anymore, though. Joe Flacco is actually just a good quarterback, I guess. This was the Jets' defense, not a unit you want to be toying around with, and Joe Flacco showed up on Thursday with his third leg ready to let loose, and my f god, he was the director to a hardcore scene in the first half. <laughs> Uh, this this is why I love football so much. Joe Flacco, at age 38, can just show up to work one day and drop one of the most historic first halves in Brown's history. Now, Joe did just stop doing things completely in the second half, but this is the New York Jets, and led by a f rough performance by Mekhi Becton and the usual offensive shenanigans, uh, <laughs> Thank God the coaching staff will be back next year to fix all the problems, but the Browns are now in the playoffs, and it, it's, it's beautiful. Oh, look at these fans. They're, they're actually happy. It sounds nice. I'd, I'd like to experience football happiness one day, too. <laughs> well, he's doing it again, as is the formula to beat the Lions. If you're able to make Jared Goff not trust his O-line, you've already done 50% of the job in defeating Detroit. Now, the other 50% has to do with actually scoring points and neutralizing the ever-growing nutsack of Daniel Campbell. And so, the Cowboys embarked on that quest and seemed to horribly fail on everything not having to do with Jared Goff. And shockingly, the Lions' defense was able to almost completely contain Dak in the offense, take away that missed safety into a 92-yard touchdown, and the Lions' defense would have held Dallas scoreless in the first half. I mean, seriously, the Lions' defense, more specifically their secondary, was really good for their standards. Maybe a few more double teams on CD would have been nice, but they had a plan. And if they were going to win this game, Jared Goff was going to have to wake up. And... <sighs> the mother for sure as hell took his sweet time, but eventually, he did get things going, taking the Lions down for a game-tying touchdown, and all the Lions had to do now was kick the extra... Uh, Dan, are, are you sure about this? Going going for two? Right here? Alright, you know what? F*** it, sure, let's, let's ride. Just, just make sure you have a perfect play call here, alright? So let, let's see what you got. Play action. End zone. There it is! What else could be? Touching by number 68. Yeah, after the dust settled, it looked like the Lions were just robbed out of a free win. But after the game, it was revealed they intentionally used deception on the referee, I guess by accident, but tried to deceive the Cowboys, and it didn't really work, so choose who you want to blame. But after Pettigrew's play was called back, they decided to keep going for two again for reasons, and it didn't work out. Now, well, let's take a step back, though, because this loss in a vacuum really isn't super consequential with the Niners' win, but that doesn't mean the team morale isn't going to take a massive hit, because this loss is, it is definitely going to burn for a little while. That's why he's the MVP! We just watched the NFL MVP walk to the podium and probably grab the award. After this was Tyreek's award and he lost it by getting injured, Dak got the reins and then he sh himself, and then Brock Purdy had his chance last week, and that didn't go great, and this week, Lamar had his turn, and unlike the guys before him, Lamar Jackson got his shot, and I mean, you don't need me to say anything. 56 points? 56 points scored and 5 touchdowns by Lamar alone? And the offense isn't even the strength of this team, if we're being honest. This is an offense that apparently can erupt for near 60 on any day, and can also casually shut out the best offense in football. But although I have no issues with the Ravens hype train rolling strong, besides, um, <laughs> they, they kind of just celebrated like they won the AFC Championship, which, yeah, okay, but the, the Dolphins are honestly kind of This is the doomsday scenario for Miami. Not only are Waddle, Jalen Phillips, Connor Williams, and way too many others to even begin to keep track of them all, but in the game, Tua, Xavier Howard, and Bradley Chubb went down, so this might be it. It's not really your fault, but the injuries are a plague that you can't outrun. Many have been consumed by them this year, and you're simply next in line, Miami, but you do have a chance to somehow change this season's narrative. If you can take down Buffalo next week, I got... I got no faith in you, but, um, I guess the way that you're gonna do it is through the best dad of all time having a historic day, so I guess it can be done. You know, I, I was checking my past scripts, you know, just going through my past recaps to see just, 
just checking on what I've been saying about the Eagles, and I realized, you know, somehow, I haven't really gone on a long-ass Eagles rant. I wasn't super jovial towards them after their small loss to the 49ers, but, um, yeah, that streak ends today. Uh, go grab something else to vomit in, Eagles fans, assuming your trash can is already filled to the brim, because, my god, what happened with this team? Uh, this team is like the 2020 Steelers reborn, where... Where do I even start with this one game, too? I, I guess I'll, I'll just start reeling off stats, and you can try to keep track. Uh, Kyler Murray finally had an above-average game versus this sorry-ass defense. The Cardinals never punted one time in this game. Arizona had the most first downs in a game they've ever had in since Kurt Warner played for them. DeAndre Swift could only manage 61 yards against the Arizona run defense off of the usual inside zone. They got fisted in the time of possession battle, and they gave up 35 points and lost to the Arizona Cardinals. I, I just don't understand. Uh, one loss, and it's excusable, okay? Fine, whatever. We can brush past it. Two losses, all right? We might have a problem. Three losses, someone needs to be fired. And four losses in five games, and Eagles fans worldwide need to be put on live watch. This might be the most underperforming team given the talent level I've ever seen. And to be honest, I'm not even very surprised with the outcome of this game. I never thought they'd lose it, I'll admit that, but uh, the red flags were plentiful before, and it all just built up to this stew of sh**. But I guess we do have to at least give some credit to the Cardinals for exposing Philly's defense a little bit more and now dropping themselves out of a top three selection. So yeah, Welcome, Philly. Well, welcome to, to rock bottom, and if they don't get a f Ray Lewis-level motivational speech from Brandon Graham or some other old dude in that locker room, like I said last week, you will not escape the first round of the playoffs. Fix it, you assholes. Yes! Yeah! Wow. Uh, the player was arrested before the game, and it wasn't a Raider? <laughs> How undisciplined of you, Indianapolis. Seriously, do better. Domestic violence charges? <laughs> We only do DUIs and gun crimes here in Vegas. That's that's weak. But um, when the game began, once again, it was just it was so boring. Maybe Colts fans think otherwise, but as I've said before, this was just such a tough year to watch as a Raiders fan in terms of entertainment, and this game was more of the same. The Colts ran the ball all over us all game long, and if they didn't drop three easy passes early on, this one could have really gotten out of hand given our offensive... Uh, handicaps. I'll be honest with you, I really wanted to see Jimmy Garoppolo come out in the second half. Our playoff hopes were on life support. We needed a spark plug desperately, and unfortunately, Aiden O'Connell is just bad at football, but the savior, Jimmy Garoppolo, never came. And instead, the Colts continued to run the ball every damn play, and two game-sealing Jack Jones penalties wrapped it up. The Raiders' 2023 season is now over. We lost to the better team. I, I can't really complain at all. We just don't have much talent disparity, mainly at quarterback, but as long as we don't f*** up our first round in the draft for the first time since like 2014, we have a shot at being possibly mediocre next year, so that should be fun. Um, and, th and thank you for joining me on this ride of misery as per usual. And in conclusion, f*** Josh McDaniels. <laughs> So, Rams, after everything that happened for you this year, it all boiled down to a simple formula. Win and Seattle loses, and you're in the playoffs. As long as you can beat the New York Giants, Orange Jesus can take the wheel, but you quite literally couldn't have made this game less convincing. Well, what the f*** are you doing? The O-line was garbage. Maybe don't let Stafford get instantly pressured and sacked four times against one of the heaviest blitzing teams in the league, but... Even adding on the pressure, that still doesn't excuse Stafford's poor play. He was literally one of the hottest quarterbacks in the league in terms of uh, in terms of actual play on the field. Sorry, I didn't word that correctly. And against the New York Giants, now you fold? But remember, the Giants are the New York Giants, and they played like the New York Giants for 58 minutes and 12 seconds long. It's just... <laughs> the, the Rams special teams goofed a little, allowing the game to be closer than it needed to be, and then they allowed Tyrod Taylor to scramble up the middle to set up... My god. Is, is that Mason Crosby? I, I didn't even know he was alive anymore. Alright, let's see if the old man has anything left in his flesh prison. <laughs> and No. No, he doesn't. Not, not even particularly close. And the Rams have clinched a playoff spot with the Seattle loss. And um, I guess they're not really on that Bills level of scary for me, but with Puka Nakua, Matty T, Cooper Cup, and Kyron, 
you do not want to see this team in the playoffs over a team like Minnesota, obviously. And hey, this is setting up nicely for a Lions Rams matchup in the playoffs. So that'll be that'll be fun to see Stafford return home if it works out that way. So thank you again, Roger. Thanks for pulling through again, brother. Uh... Titans football time. Who's ready? Woo! Yeah, yeah. You know, it, is it just me, or does it feel illegal to watch Derrick Henry in late December playing against a divisional team, and he's getting clamped? It just, it feels wrong, but the Titans are a terrible team, so that was par for the course, and with Stroud back in action, this game quite literally was not competitive for a singular minute past the first touchdown scored. Things will get interesting with Houston next week, with them getting healthier, but for the Titans, you, you did it again! Will Levis got... Again! I, this offensive line needs to be completely restructured. Damn near everyone except maybe Peter Skaronsky needs to be executed. Still though, it's been the same complaints every week for the Titans, so I won't keep pushing a nail into a dead f***ing animal, but changes need to happen to probably every offensive position for Tennessee except for quarterback, and I'd probably cut off a few fingers to have Will Anderson and CJ Stroud on my team. I, the young talent Houston has at this point is just, it's unfair. Your fantasies can't ever be quenched, can they? Now, I would say I didn't see this game coming, but of course, of course this happened. This was the most NFC South thing I've ever seen this year, and since the Falcons lost to the Panthers. But the New Orleans Saints played all the way up to their full potential at times, and, and Baker Mayfield, who's been one of the NFL's hottest quarterbacks by play on the field over the last couple of weeks, went f ass stale. I mean, Baker was lighting teams up for 332 yards per game over the past two weeks before this week, and he just dropped 43 yards in the first half. <laughs> And Mike Evans had a 33-yard catch, too. The game was honestly just the Saints dropping the hog on Tampa in the first half, and then inefficiently strangling them to death in the second half, with Kamara getting injured. And hey, I guess the, the playoffs are still mildly possible, New Orleans. If you can beat Atlanta and somehow have Baker fumble the bag versus one of his old teams, then they can still win the division. So, just pray, New Orleans. All you can do is pray. <laughs> Welcome to part three of Justin Fields' auditions for other teams, and in this one, he looked pretty damn great. You know, he still has his faults, but thanks to Atlanta's defense, they uh, made Justin Fields look like prime Lamar, because the man could not be tackled, and the game itself just ended instantly after the first DJ Moore touchdown. But instead of a fun attempt at a comeback, Atlanta's decaying corpse was displayed for the entire country to see, as the last remains of Arthur Smith as an NFL coach were plucked away with each and every one of Taylor Heineke's three interceptions. I mean, what a f***ing mess, Atlanta, but if you've been watching my recaps for at least a few weeks, you know I've been, um, <laughs> passionate about the Falcons' failures this year, so I'm probably done with Atlanta rants, but I will say, there is a solid chance that one of the teams that Justin Fields might be trying out for is actually the Falcons. I feel like alongside Drake London, Kyle Pitts, and Bijan Unlocked, that could be a fun, fun offense, so get rid of the mustache, man, and please, please, Atlanta, just be fun next year. That's all I'm asking. Ugh, couldn't you just go out there and beat a bottom five team by 30, Buffalo, so that people can seriously fear you? Why are you like this for the entire season? This has always been a team that I feel like can possibly just beat the 49ers by 30 or lose to the Panthers by 10. But luckily, Josh Allen, who didn't look like himself on Sunday, is still enough ammo on offense to be able to outlast a team whose best offensive weapon is Ezekiel Elliott. The game was a good try by Belichick, though. He did his trademark muddying the waters thing against more talent, but luckily he was able to pull out the defeat. And hey, they, they might just f around and clinch the number to pick, which could be absolutely massive for their future. And for Buffalo, like I said for Miami, get ready. The showdown is coming, so bring the stove, toaster, and any other mechanical cooker to grab home field advantage for a round, because that could really change everything. And if you lose, if you lose and the Steelers somehow win, I... You know what? No, no. I don't even want to think about that scenario. That, that, would, that would truly be the darkest timeline. Man. The Carolina Panthers just keep getting more and more depressing. I, one more week, Panthers fans. All you have to do is stomach one more week and the pain will be over. But uh, this game might have been the worst loss of the season. However, I just... <laughs> I don't have the heart to dig any deeper anymore. I'm sorry. It's, it's too cruel. It's too cruel. And CJ Beathard and Etienne did stuff to get the win, I guess. And now the battle for the AFC South will occur next week for Jacksonville. But somehow... The Jaguars have actually made this a battle, but it's simple. All they have to do is win. 
Win the game, and no questions will be asked, and you'll enter the playoffs with a clean slate and hopefully a healthy Trevor Lawrence, and they'll win the Super Bowl. But before we get into the 1 o'clock games, I gotta talk to you about this video sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy, which you should be familiar with by now, is the easiest way to play fantasy sports, in my opinion, and my personal favorite way to do that is through the pick'em game format, where you simply choose whether you think a player will go higher or lower on any stat you choose, and depending on how many you get right in a row, you can win up to 20 times your initial money. And for these upcoming Sunday slash Saturday games, I've got two picks right here, which are Aaron Jones under 71 and a half rushing yards, and Michael Pittman over 72 and a half receiving yards. So, if you want to tail this pick'em entry, or I guess make your own, and you live in one of these many states in orange on the screen here, then click the link in the description to sign up with promo code Tub Frog and Underdog will match your first deposit of up to $100. And if you haven't signed up with my code yet, then you can take advantage of a free square where all Patrick Mahomes has to do this week is find a way to throw for a singular yard. So if that sounds fun to you, then get started on Underdog Fantasy and make sure to use promo code Tub Frog for a massive discount. And with that, let's get back to the recap. <laughs> Yeah, um, actually though, what, what do you want me to say here? I guess it was a little scary that the 49ers were playing Washington close early on, but eventually Sam Howell basically ended the game with a 14-point swing with a pick deep in the red zone. So, yeah, if, if the Commanders lose versus the Cowboys, they'll clinch the number two pick, which is pretty cool, I guess. And, and meanwhile, because Philly just sucks, the 49ers also now have the number one seed on lock, seemingly all but guaranteeing a Super Bowl rematch between the Ravens and 49ers. So I'm pretty hyped to see a ton of resting starters next week. It's going to be fun. <laughs> yep, it's tank bowl time. Jared Stidham versus Easton Stick. Let's f do it. So it's time for some god-awful football. I mean, just look at this box score, man. Look at this. This is going to be a time capsule in a few years. These names. Easton Stick? Jared Stidham? Alex Erickson? <laughs> oh, who the hell is little Jordan Humphrey? But whatever. With, with Russell Wilson banished to the Shadow Realm for his sins against Sean Payton, as I thought, he's going to be gone next year. But even without him and Cortland Sutton, Denver was able to lose the Tank Bowl by winning the game. Hey, but maybe after f***ing up Quentin Johnston, you might want to look at Brock Bowers or something in LA. Just do what you can to help Herbert, or trade him. Honestly, f*** it. At this point, I don't care. Just help him out. But, um, seriously, this game might have been the most forgettable of the entire season. I have nothing else to say. What a terrible year for the Chargers. Not proud to admit it, but I actually thought they were going to be a good team this year. <laughs> And I've learned my lesson now. Never again, never again will I ever put faith in the Chargers. What is going on? Actually, two 30-point games in a row for the Pittsburgh Steelers? The universe must just be folding in on itself. I was absolutely convinced the score of this game was going to be like 10 to 13 or 16 to 13, something like that. But Najee Harris, Jalen Warren, and the Steelers run game were just playing bully ball. And in combination with Mason Rudolph doing game manager stuff, Seattle's defense sucking and not tackling, the Steelers did what they want when they wanted on offense. That is just a sentence that I never thought I would ever say without Weinstein back there. I, that... It didn't come out great, but you know what I mean. Now, Seattle's offense, though, put in a more than valiant effort. Seriously, I, I still don't fully believe in Geno, but the man showed heart. K-9 got hurt, and Abe Lucas and Evan Brown also both went down mid-game, so his protection against a pass rush led by, you know, TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith wasn't super great, but to be fair, Geno Smith did hold on to the ball a little long in the strip sack that pretty much ended the game. So the Steelers pulled off the win, and this made things as interesting as possible. Now both teams are at the very least going to have a fighting chance at the playoffs, so welcome to the Rumble, Pittsburgh and Seattle. Good luck making the tournament. See you next week. I love you, and I miss you. <sighs> Not only are you eliminated from the playoffs with this loss, but... It had to be against the Chiefs in Arrowhead, just to make it a little bit worse. The Bengals tried, but um, maybe maybe trash-talking one of the best secondaries in the NFL isn't the greatest idea, only to go out there and not even break three catches it doesn't seem like the wisest of choices. The Bengals' defense is still bad, but to their credit, they really only held the Chiefs to field goals for the most part. Harrison Butker, I'm sure, lost a lot of people a lot of fantasy games and led the Chiefs to winning the division by war of attrition. But I mean... At the same time, it was a lost year for you, Cincinnati. You can only be so upset about how this game ended, too, with Joe Burrow's injury.
injury starting the season clearly hindering him, only for another injury to put him on IR. At the very least, when he's healthy, he's still a top four quarterback. So turn your attention to the O-line defense and what the hell to do with T. Higgins and gear up for a potential deep run next year when you're healthier. Huh, Jaron Hall? That's the guy you want to put in when you have a playoff spot on the line? Really? Okay, I guess, uh, sure. Who am I to judge the almighty god hand of Kevin O'Connell? And Jaron Hall went out there and had one of the worst first halves I've ever seen a sports player have. I mean, the man looked like a below average high school quarterback, and by the time that Nick Mullins came in to try and stop the ship, he was already 30 miles underwater, and Jordan Love was casually having another unstoppable primetime game. Jordan Love is so good, man, and I'm happy that he keeps doing this on primetime too, so more people can really realize that he is a franchise quarterback, and to be honest with you, I think the NFL is just more fun when the Packers are a good football team, so I'm happy for them. I really am, and the playoffs are actually still a thing, and for Minnesota, I guess they are too, but God, I hope they stay 30 feet away at all times. I, I'd much rather see Jordan Love in, and I'm sure everybody else would too. But before we go, you know what time it is. It's time for the Tub Frog Discord Awards, where I turn to you, the people, to see what you thought were the best and worst highlights from Week 17. And with that, you said the best play from Week 17 was CeeDee Lamb's 92-yard touchdown where the Lions botched a sack, and also another play that definitely won some fantasy games, and the best game from Week 17 went to Eagles vs. Cardinals, which, you know, depending on who you're a fan of, I guess you could look at it in a whole different light, but then you said the best individual performance from Week 17, I mean, this was never going to be close, right? Look at Lamar, man, look at him! This is the MVP, a two-time MVP? Come on now. The man's on his way to a Hall of Fame career, and the worst team performance from Week 17... <laughs> The Eagles put up 30 points, 30 plus points, and they're on this list. Honestly, it's more of like a defensive thing. The offense still obviously has just so many flaws, but at least they could score. But yeah, sure, I guess they deserve the spot. And the worst individual performance, Travis Kelsey. I mean, they won, and J Jaron Hall didn't win this? What, guys, what are we doing here? And then I asked what your favorite rodent is, and uh, through all the options, one. One singular rodent took the crown, the capybara. Wow, that's, that is a steaming take right there, but all right, I'll trust you guys. Anyways, if you like this video, then subscribe, because I got a lot of videos on the channel just like this one. And if you did like this video, then watch this video that I just did on Robert Griffin III and the tragedy that was his NFL career. It's pretty good, trust me. And thanks to all my Patreons for pledging $1. It means a lot, but anyways, until next time.